we can start soon. Uh, good evening, friends, uh, and uh, welcome to the questionnaire. Uh, this is a continuing part of our series of uh, wise casts that you've been doing. And uh, so under the heading EMI, Economy Markets and Investments, uh, as you know, we've been doing the webinars, uh, trying to improve uh, the uh, knowledge that uh, investors have about the economy markets and their investments so that you make truly wise decisions when you actually choose uh, uh, various uh, mutual funds or uh, any other investment options. So we originally did a first EMI, which was a very extended one for about hour and a half. Uh, we got a very good response, but then what we thought is that we should break it up into parts so that we can address it. And last week we did the July edition. This will be a monthly uh, offering from our side, these webinars. And in the July edition, the part one covering the economy, we uh, did the webinar last week. Uh, overwhelming response to that. Uh, we've had more than 120,000 views uh, across YouTube, Facebook, and uh, Twitter. And uh, it's from about 300 odd cities. And it's obviously not just an urban phenomenon, lots of smaller towns and all that phenomenal response. So thank you very much for that. And then we've been inundated with questions on these things, you know, because we want to keep this 45 minute bit very rigid and so that you know the people don't allocate too much time to it but obviously it throws up a lot of questions and we've been inundated with questions on uh, all the various media twitter facebook so what we thought is that we'll launch a series called the question hour which following in the week following the uh, webinar right we will do a question hour dedicated to that webinar so then it gives you a week to go through. I know lots of people can't see 45 minutes at a stretch. You can see it, you know, 15 minutes, three part bits. And then all the doubts and question, we thought we'll collect it. And as I said, the response has been overing. While we have said question R, obviously we will have a limited amount of time to handle questions and we'll try and do as much as possible. My team here will also try to consolidate the questions, similar questions together, right? But before that, right, now it's been a week. Now, a week is a very short time for the markets and the economy. Data comes to us every day, right? So what I thought I'll do with, to you for the next 15 minutes is to give you a quick highlights package of what we did last week. And I'll then run you past the updates that is post that. What are the data that has changed? So what is the view? Has it been modified? It remains the same. So that before we start the question, you get a good sense of the lay of the land. So... Let's do the highlights of last week's thing first. So first things first on the economic crisis, right? We compared it to the global financial crisis and said that this time we expect a V-shaped recovery versus a U-shaped recovery. The reasons for that were multiple laid out in the slide here. The second aspect is the unprecedented global monetary stimulus that's there. As you can see from the spike there, compared to the global financial crisis, multiple times the amount has been pumped in. In addition to that, the rate cuts which have been done are also taken the rates far lower than prevalent during the global financial crisis. So clearly, the governments have been far more serious and far more quick in terms of attacking this problem. And then on the fiscal side, that's the government spending themselves. As you can see, something like 1.5% of GDP versus that 4% of GDP. And the direction of the fiscal spending has been on the supply side, which is another reason for the V-shaped expectations. The medical response, of course, was the lockdown. As we all know, it has been a success world over. And today, the governments were moving towards easing their mobility and resumption of economic activities. Coming to India, the same. The only thing is that our lockdown was longer than the rest of the world and more severe than the rest of the world. So if you see as a proportion of the world, right, uh, this is the data as of yesterday, right, if you highla have highlighted India there, and it's important to take away the success of our thing because against the 17 percent share of the world population we have eight percent number of cases so only half our uh, share of the world population and more importantly of the share of deaths it's only four and a half percent and our recovery rate is better than our this day so by and large you must admit that the lockdown has been a success medically and not only that we have succeeded in protecting most of india from the impact of the coronavirus. So the red spots are the containment zones. Uh, unfortunately, the GDP is concentrated there. So while most of India is free of the virus, yes, the GDP is in the containment zones to a large extent. So the economic recovery will naturally be slower. 
right? So this summarizes what I just said to you now. So we move to unlock 1.0 and unlock 2.0 now. But the Indian response as compared to the global response was affected by the fact that our economy was already in a slowdown, right? So if you see here, the GDP, right, has come down. Last quarter, especially it has come down because on top of an existing slowdown in the economy, we've had the COVID come and take it down. Right? So as a result of fiscal deficit, which you originally thought would be 3.3 for this year, already pre-crisis, it had moved to 4.6. So naturally constrained, any stimulus was constrained by the fiscal deficit challenges. And still a 21 lakh stimulus was announced, which would have actually implied 16.7% fiscal deficit. Obviously we can't afford that. But innovative structuring, which I call Jugard, which I will not go through now in detail, has taken the fiscal deficit only to 6.2 instead of a 16.7, which would have been. The innovations you saw last time, so I shall not repeat it uh, unless somebody has a question. So the total fiscal deficit of the state plus center is actually around 11.5% this year in terms of the fiscal. So at the same time, the short-term impact obviously is quite severe. The medium-term economic outlook, as I can just remind people, arises from the opportunity from China's population aging faster than India's. India's for next 30 years is likely to be a positive supply of labor into the economy. The second is that the relative to the actual number of people, we are taking on six times the people that China is losing. Third is that from a per capita cost point of view, we are at one fifth of China, again, a big advantage. Fourth is on a skill level, with this basic moderate advance we have in all the places. And more importantly, India has made a strong jump in the ease of doing business, EODB rankings. As a result today, we compare very favorably as a destination. So this augurs well for our economy that foreign manufacturing can shift from China mostly into India, right? So FDI is critical for that for our economy to grow because we don't have the capital. Our fiscal deficit is already high, so the government's fiscal ability to spend is low, right, number one. So fiscal uh, FDI flows have been rising. We account for 3.3% of the world. We are ranked ninth in the world. Government has been taking further initiatives. What corporate tax cut for new companies to 17% equal to the best in the world. Plus sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, Further, their dividend distribution tax has been removed and any tax on interest also is away for SWF. Third is the fact that India has got a stable currency. That's very positive for our country because any FDI, FII flows come in, they don't like currency volatility. We have $500 million of reserves and the long-term rate of depreciation of any country is decided by the interest rate differential, which has roughly been 5%. So that much is expected by foreigners. As long as we stick to that, it's fine. Last year was a bad year. We 9.6 was our depreciation. But because of that, we don't expect a great depreciation. So in returning to growth for India, we believe that though this year we'll see a 4.2 negative GDP growth, we think that next year itself, a positive double-digit growth on a low base is eminently possible. So let me, that was the highlights. Let me just quickly take you through what are the updates. I showed certain slides they have now updated them for data later. And here I will tell you that green shoots, which are visible, right? We talked about driving trends, right? I've updated that to end of June. We've talked about uh, Apple mobility trends in the various countries. We've talked about American consumer sentiment, as you can clearly see the V-shaped up there. You can see restaurant bookings coming up there. You can see the US real personal consumption expenditure and the unemployment rate. Unemployment rate is coming down. So both, again, positive, and household debt to GDP of America, which was 97% in the previous crisis, is only 74%. So American consumers have room to borrow to grow the consumption basket, right? So the Baltic Dry Index, right, is another indicator. As you can see, in the pre-crisis, it was 1,090 levels, come down to 600 due to the crisis, and has bounced back to 1894. So clearly, People are booking ships to send their goods out three months, six months down the road. So clearly that impact is clearly seen. But more importantly, China was the one which got COVID first. And since following the China recovery is something the markets are towards the eye. So as you can see, China has had a V-shape. The US and the Euro zone are also following through. Same with the China manufacturing and services PMI. Both have seen a V-shaped jump back. 
infrastructure and capex are actually leading the growth in China. Plus, in the services industry also, you can see that by end of second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, Chinese economy should be back to pre-COVID normal levels. Right? So, the developing story of the world is a world trending towards a V-shaped recovery in GDP. Come to focus on India, we said that India is comparatively most successful. But there is one thing which we need to remember that most recently, this was the slide I put up last time. And this is the difference. As you can see, in just this one week, India has added 216,516 new cases. And our share of the world of thing has gone up to 1.9%. So while we did a very good uh, controlling of the uh, medical crisis initially during the lockdown, as unlock one and unlock two are opening, that is itself spreading the virus. So to some extent, we have to be cautious on the economic recovery. That's what I want to show you here, that actually the unlock is coming with an increase in number of cases, but we are still better off compared to the rest of the world. But from our economy recovery perspective, the opening up, it's something the other world countries also experience. So COVID's trajectory is important for us to follow. So as you can see, case flattening inside with number of days per level. We should track this recovery and death rates with a 14 day lag, right? So, can you see recovery is going up? So, these are the things we should continuously track to make sure that the fresh crisis do not come and affect the economy too deeply, right? So, this is the, where the unlock phases have come through. The other thing, which there is a question here, so I thought I would actually include this slide. People have asked me how the Atman Nirbha package, how far is it? So, as a part of my reply to the question, I want to leave this slide here. So the 3 lakh crore of collateral free loans for MSMEs, you can see 1.2 lakh crore has been sanctioned and 62,000 crore has been disbursed. 45,000 crore partial guarantee scheme, you see 31% of that has been approved and another 13% is the process of approval. So you can see in each one of these, right, there is progress happening on all the Atman Nibar program. So that's one answer to one of the questions which came up, right? And the other growth part is you saw that most of rural India is impact, not impacted. So the Kharif swing has jumped to an early monsoon. Fertilizer uh, consumption has gone up. That's good news. Job demand is good news. Unemployment has gone back to pre-COVID levels. That's good news. All of these slides have updated further data to show you that the graph trend remains the same. You saw the number of business arrangements was at 70.5, slight drop to 69.2. And traffic congestion, again, the same story. Uh, daily registration on motor vehicles, same story. Uh, power generation, the same story. Uh, household work, we already saw this slide. And these are some short frequency indicators. If there are specific questions around these indicators, we can come back. Otherwise, it's a very uh, complex slide for you to see. Uh, EVA bill generation date, 7th to 13th July. So we have done it. It's, again, you're showing slight flattening, right? Electronic toll collection. It had sharply gone up and then now is flattening. So that's the message I want to give you, right? Jeffrey's TV's ad index. Again, a sharp bounce back, but then a leveling and a flattening. And manufacturing PMI's rebound, right? So from that point of view, we also saw that exports were normalizing faster than imports, as a result of which our current account has turned into surplus, which is good news from a fiscal deficit perspective. So on the economy itself, this is the World Bank's projections. Uh, they stick to that. So as you can see, India in the middle, 4.5% GDP down. And next year, they're expecting a 6% GDP up. These are calendar year numbers. I'm showing a 10% because the three more months which you add will make a sharp difference to the GDP. So on the fiscal deficit, because ultimately we have to remember that India's fiscal deficit is a key part of our economic growth. The center plus state fiscal deficit we expect it from the 11.5%, 12% to come down to 8.5%. So that's one important thing to remember is the improvement in that. India has done a lot of structural reforms which are listed out here. And hence, we don't expect India to get a meaningful downgrade. So we think by and large that should be protected. So with that, I think uh, I've done with the uh, updates that I wanted to give you. So I'm now happy to invite my team to uh, start off with the question and answer session. Um, thank you, Sunil. Um, here's the first question. This is from Deepa. For the current spike in the market, what are the points we need to be cautious about? 
what is the ideal communication to clients? So I think the, uh, the important thing in the current spike is that it's a liquidity driven spike. So as I was showing you from the economic data, a V-shaped recovery in the economy is expected and the markets were anticipating that and the spike happened. Why did the spike happen? Partly because of this and partly because of the fact that there is money to buy. And now what is to watch out for is, is this liquidity at risk? Now, how will the liquidity into India be at risk? One, the US election uncertainty. So keep a watch for that because any adverse news there could mean a reversal of flows. Number two, if the world economy, if Chinese economy is going to recover very fast, there could be a diversion of flow into China. And if the developed economies are recovering faster, there could be more money changing their own home markets. Number two. Number three is this immediate V-shaped recovery that you see. And as you can see in certain economic indicators, it is showing a flattening. So there is a, obviously a pent-up demand which leads to a jump up, but you can't expect that the same rate of growth will retain. So there will be a flattening and the markets will also recognize that. So I would suggest that to track these economic indicators closely to see whether the initial V-shaped bounce back is sustaining, slowing down or reversing back, which could be due to the COVID crisis itself and medically, as you saw, the number of cases are increasing. So lots of factors there to keep in mind in terms of advising the clients to keep these economic trackers in mind because the markets ultimately are a real indicator of the economy. Next question. Right. Yeah. The next question is uh, from Sandeep Bhushetti. In India, it looks like stock specific rally in the market. Do you think about a broad based rally in the coming time of markets? Uh, well, I think that it's going to be stock specific for some time to come because if you recollect one of the slides I put up, so what happens in every sector, there are companies that are affected by COVID very, very differently. And second aspect here is that uh, whether you take a medical thing, let's say which pharma company can get this better than others. Whether the telecom, let's say who's going to gain market share. So I think in a time when the economic recovery is happening in the future, right? Only when the reality of the economic recovery is broad-based will your stock picking be broad-based. Right now, fund managers, whether they're FIR fund managers or domestic fund managers, are trying to find the winners who will, A, not go insolvent in this downturn, and two, be able to survive and grow in the upturn. You can't say that now today that all companies will grow. So I think a broad-based rally is going to be, take some time to come. I think you will have to look at it as uh, specific to companies, specific to sectors within com uh, companies within sectors on who will be the winners. So I think it's also in such downturn times, it's a winner take all. So even a slight winner, it's like, you know, in the voting you see, right? Even one vote more and you get the full seat to yourself, right? First past the post, they call it. So the winners will get an extra share of money. So the polarization of the market, I suspect, will continue for some time to come. Our next question, next question is, do you still believe there will be a V-shaped recovery? So, uh, like I just said, I see signs of the economic recovery flattening out, right? Now, if that flattening out is followed by a fresh recovery, you will largely get a V-ish look. But if the crisis, the medical crisis, is spins out of control, like I said, already we are at now 8%. We were at 6.2 a uh, week ago. Sometime back, we were 4%. So 17% is our share of the world population. So we are approaching half of that now. So I think that if the medical thing takes a turn for the worse, right, and you'll see that, you know, there's a corporate uh, in uh, Maharashtra, right, where 200 plus workers uh, test positive. So the supply side impact, if that comes and affect workers, as you open up, that's a risk you carry. So if there is a fresh downturn, you're looking at a W. But my request is that whether it's a V or it's a W, it's a matter of a year. So when you then go long enough into a three-year time frame, this W, because the next shortfall and the rise will be so close. I don't see that you will see a W, which is a double V. Okay. I'll see that there could be a small correction in the economy and then a rise. So W is eminently possible, but in the long run, it doesn't matter because by the end of a year, I expect the growth part of the arm of the V or the W as the case may be to be strongly apparent. Our next question is, what will be the impact of COVID-19 on corporate earnings? 
So it's not going to be uh, good news. So maybe I can just show you a slide. Though actually, I would recommend that you all dial into next week's webinar where I'll be covering the markets. But since the question has been asked, uh, I will just show you a slide where the uh, earnings are uh, there. Uh, uh, can you see these slides? Can somebody tell me? Um, yes, yes, we can see. Yeah. Okay. So just hold on. I'll just uh, locate a slide of a copy. Uh, because this is the earnings for the last quarter that I am looking for. I want to use that to tell you that the last quarter showed the COVID effect uh, already. And the coming quarter, you will see that uh, uh, enhanced even more. So just one, one minute. Just give me a minute and I'll look at this. Slide. Yeah. So you're able to see this slide? So is this is yes. the, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Shweta, can we see the slide? Yes, sir. So, so this gives you the impact on the quarter four when the COVID crisis was upon us, right? Lockdown started mid-March, but COVID affected obviously. So as you can see here, the overall stock market, if you see the sales is down 7%. So that's the GDP recession reflecting itself. The EBITDA is called operating profits. As you can see, they had a 23% drop in operating margins. And because interest costs remain the same and they don't fall off. And if you've taken a moratorium, your interest costs are going to be higher because they're not come down due to the payment. You're seeing a 46% drop in earnings. So the next quarter, definitely Corporate India will show you the impact. So I think, yes, corporate earnings will be showing the impact. But on a markets related, I'll address this next week. The markets, to some extent, have discounted the expected negative growth this quarter. So only a surprise, which is more surprising than the expectation, will be a bad news for the market. Any earnings reported which is less bad news than expected will actually see a positive bounce back. So not necessarily that bad earnings season is going to mean a correction in the stock market. Just as a caution. But next week, I'll try and address this in a little more detail. Next question. What is the prediction on GDP and is there a fear of a recession? Well, what is the fear of a recession? We are in a recession already. Uh, the prediction for the GDP uh, for the calendar year is 4.5% negative. Uh, we think that uh, depending on how the recovery goes, uh, the financial year could see actually slightly better 4.2 negative, even 4.5 is negative. But it could go our a base case scenario is 4.2, but a worst case scenario could take it to even 10% negative if, if this falls off. So, but however, since this year is so bad and all GDP data are calculated year on year, so next year first quarter will be compared to this year first quarter. This year first quarter is going to be very bad. So next year's first quarter in relation to that bad will look good. So we do expect anywhere between a six to a double digit YOY GDP growth in the quarters next year. And in fact, there's a possibility that the whole of next year could turn out to be double digit. So I would say that's exactly the V-shape that I'm talking about, but a very bad this year, but a very good next year. Next question. Right. Uh, will the consumption story pick up? And if yes, which sectors would stand to gain? No, I don't see a reason why consumption should not pick up. Uh, for the reason that the lockdown introduced an artificial crash in consumption. Right, And so in terms of a pickup, there is a pent up demand. So clearly the FMCG, the fast moving consumer goods will see the pickup, but again, market related, the market has already knows that they've discounted that. So the bounce back in the FMCG valuations may not be so great because market knows this. The second sector which can show a recovery is any consumer durable, which is used in rural India. The reason being, as I showed you, the COVID impact has been less on rural India. You had a good rabi harvest. You had a good kharif sowing. So the farmers are feeling well enough and rich enough. Consumer surplus in their hands is more. So what are the items that farmers buy? Farmers buy, they don't buy air conditioners and refrigerators so much because power supply while it's coming, what do they buy? They, for them, a status symbol is always a vehicle. So a guy who doesn't have a vehicle who's a two-wheeler, oh, sorry, a cycle will buy a two-wheeler. A guy who's got a two-wheeler will go at an entry-level car. The guy who's already got a decent car will go into upgrade into a car, one. Second is, so auto 
in that segment, both motorcycles, scooters, as well as cars should be able to pick up. Second is with the sewing and he's feeling good about the monsoon, automobiles which are used in his business, that is the agriculture business, just tractors, power tillers, those should see. So I see that in the consumption story, auto and related components. And mind you, in auto and all of that, they are largely rural consumption driven. Urban consumption will take time. So you got to look at the kind of vehicles. So I would say two wheelers, entry level vehicles and tractors and power tillers are probably at the lead of the consumer uh, durable story. Other things like refrigerator and all that, sadly for them, this lockdown has come in the heat of the summer. That's when their sales picks up. So I think they have missed the boat for this year. The best selling season they have missed. So there will be a slightly delayed recovery on the rest of the consumer durable pack. So the next, next question, question we have is um, which sectors of the economy are likely to recover the fastest and slowest? So the fastest, as I said, I would expect auto to show a pretty good recovery fast because of the reasons I explained in the answer to the previous question. FMCG will also recover well because those other people have been pent up. The third thing is I would expect is the services sector because going to malls, uh, going to movie halls, all of this is a pent up thing. So when a unlock really works and everybody goes out, they will grow rush back to do the things they normally like to do. So socializing. So I think that would follow. What are the slowest sectors to follow? And uh, here, the banking and financial services. So banking financial services comprises banks, NBFCs, uh, insurance companies, wealth management companies, and uh, asset management companies. So if you see there, I would say that insurance companies, clearly the COVID crisis would have made health insurance and life insurance something which is more in the public mind. But definitely their future looks good in terms of recovery. Uh, banks and NBFCs, there will be polarization. I think the good quality banks and the good quality NBFCs will recover well ahead of the poorer quality ones because poorer quality ones will find it hard to see through this phase. So you would actually see a very polarized BFSI space of some very good and some very bad. So I would say as a sector, it's probably in the middle. But if you do your picking of the right kind of companies there, right, which is what mutual funds are, are trying to do, you would actually see a very good recovery in that sector. The sector which will be uh, difficult uh, to recover, I would say will be the capital goods, the industrials, the cyclical sector, because clearly capacity utilization in the economy, which reached a high of 77% uh, before our slowdown started, uh, has now gone back to below 2004 levels of 69%. So there is adequate capacity in the economy to cater to any bounce back in the consumption demand of any products. So fresh capex cycle will take time to happen because what has to happen? One is the capacity utilization must improve first due to consumption. Second is the we should get all our act on getting the business to China in order for a foreigner to come and set up a factory year so that then capital goods supply to the factory can improve. I would give that at least a year to 18 months. So the economic recovery of those cyclical capital goods sector would be a bit delayed. But then the market, once it gets a wind that is definitely going to happen, would go up well before that. So I would be cautious as to taking this economic data and applying that into the market sectors. Right? I cover more of this in the uh, next uh, uh, part two session. Next question. We have another one on consumption. Because of frequent lockdowns, is the term story of consumption over for now? I don't tend to agree with that because I think the lockdown has created an artificial consumption drop, right? It's not that people didn't want to spend or they didn't have the money to spend. They had the money to spend. I'm talking about upper middle class. Yes, the lower middle class, there are people who have lost jobs, people have not got salaries. There is some Im impact on consumer surpluses at the lower middle class and the poor uh, poorer sections. But at the upper middle class and above, they've had the money, uh, they are willing to buy, but the lockdown has forced them because they really can't go and do a proper decision. So I would not agree that the term story of consumption has come down. What I would say is that the amount of people People be expected to go up from the base level of consumption to higher levels. That story has got delayed, right? The premiumization of the economy. But at the same time, at the premium end, people have had lots of time to think that they'll be ready to act when the lockdown is lifted. So I would say a sharp V bounce back and then a slow flattening, which you saw. The consumption long term story has not got impaired by the repeated lockdowns. I, I, I don't think so. Next question. 
Next question. Okay. Uh, which fund to suggest for a five-year SIP as in a fund mix for an aggressive, moderate and low risk investor? So I would request you to be patient for just one more week uh, with me because this is more about the economy uh, uh, that I take over. I'll talk to you in detail about the markets, uh, the, I think the following Wednesday, I think uh, we plan the next session. So I request you to be patient. And then the following week after that, we'll have a questionnaire on that. So any questions you have on that, I will be happy to address that. So I'd request you to be just be patient for just about a week. All right. Next question. So, uh, the next question. Uh, what is your outlook on oil prices? Well, I think that the world is uh, clearly from the World uh, Bank uh, IMF uh, GDP growth, the world is clearly in for a recession and this year. So clearly oil demand, energy demand will be less. So oil prices, uh, what can counter that? Two things can counter that. One is an artificial cut in production by the OPEC countries, right? What is a counter to that? Is that today US and Russia are both wanting to pump more oil because they want to keep oil inflation low at their end. There's a US election running up. And so from that perspective, I think oil supply will be compensated by US, Saudi Arabia, which is also generally following US dictates. So I would say that oil prices will continue to remain soft. The other counter to when oil prices can rise, if China shows a very sharp V-shaped recovery, China is one of the largest energy consumers in the world. So I think that could trigger a little bit of a rise. But our sense of the whole situation is that we think that oil prices are today very low, right? We don't think that this is sustainable. So I see a medium term trend of oil at 45 to 50 dollars. That's the uh, uh, basis on which our uh, uh, fund allocation is done. So I think at 45 to 50 dollars, the, the cushion, the good thing is that it's a good middle ground to also adopt from any strategy perspective, because if it stays at 30, the wrong hit is $15. If it goes to 75, the wrong hit is 15 to 20 dollars. So if you stay at a 45 to 50 dollar, we find it's a reasonable thing which can't uh, sway the decision making based on that price go too wrong. All right. Thank you, Sunil. The next question is please throw light on the pharma sector as we are the biggest importer of API from China. As the current scenario, the world is against China and India is also running boycott China campaigns. Yes, India is the largest importer of API, but at the same time, uh, the demand for the any COVID vaccine or drug will have to be made in India. And it's not necessarily true that that vaccine or this, that API is going to be from China. It could be from anywhere in the world, right? Because it depends on where their discovery happens. So I think that the outlook for the pharma sector, I would say, is still good. And it's not just pharma. If you look at it, it's a healthcare sector. So I would add the fact that Diagnostics. People are now much more going to be the testing, the antibody testing. So I think diagnostic labs are going to be a good uh, bet. Uh, hospitals are going to be a good, good bet. So I think the overall pharma story, thanks to COVID, has taken a turn for the positive. But longer term, bear in mind that once the COVID-related matter is over, what about 12, 18 months from now, uh, pharma itself, uh, you know, as a very drugs are sensitive in terms of both price and uh, you know FDA regulations and all. So I would again say that it's a cautious sector for the next 12 to 18 months. It's a good sector to, uh, to look at. But over a three to five year period, one has to always constantly revisit the sector. The next question, sir, is uh, what are your views on COVID? How long will COVID be here in all countries? One year, two years or more? Well, uh, from what I read about it is that uh, I have a very different take on this, right? So if you see the Spanish flu or if you see the SARS crisis, right? They went away very fast because something called herd immunity developed. And so a uh, kind of the herd, uh, the immunity spread to a larger part of the population. So fresh Spanish flu didn't come in effect. So it was a very severe initial impact, lasted for a few months and then disappeared. But unfortunately, because we are now smarter, we are more humanitarian concerned, we have far more technology available, we have chosen, and because we give value to the economy, we have chosen to do this lockdown. Now, in the lockdown, you have prevented the medical virus, right, to spread. So, while we have contained it and we have allowed the rest of the economy, wherever there is no 
uh, COVID has not spread to come bounce back and you're seeing a V-shaped recovery, we have prevented herd immunity from happening. So that's one reason this will last for a longer bit of time because it can die only when herd immunity spreads and a significant proportion of the population gets immune to it. We have distorted that picture. So it's going to stay for a fairly long time, albeit in a milder form, because by then we will have a lot of medicines which can arrest the decline, which can prevent the deaths and do. So I see a mild the COVID uh, coronavirus itself lasting for a fairly long period of time, but in a manageable, it will become like a, a super common cold, you know, your flu, normal influenza flu, it will be like that. That is that is my, my read of this uh, as a perspective. Uh, completely eradicating it through a vaccine, uh, I think will take will take time. So I think we are going to live in a situation. The second aspect why I expect it to do is that the lockdown caused severe economic damage, right? Forget the coronavirus. So the severe economic damage has forced the governments to unlock perhaps a little earlier than they really medically they should do. From a humanitarian perspective, they should have continued the lockdown, but the deleterious effect on the economy means they are opening up a little bit faster. Now, in that opening up process, this containment of the virus is then lost and you're really spreading it. And you're seeing that in the data of what India has showed, how we are suddenly worsened. Uh, China also saw a small spike. US is suddenly worsened. So I think the impatience, the battle between economy versus humanity is also meaning that this is going to take longer because it's going to now spread to newer areas and then take, they'll have fresh lockdowns like you're seeing Bihar and Bangalore now suddenly coming into a lockdown uh, scenario, whereas a month, two months ago, they were like, you know, merrily saying we don't have a big problem here. So I think that we are going to live with this for a fairly long time. Is it one year, two years or three years? I think that uh, definitely one year. Uh, two years, yes, I think there's a 50% probability Three years, maybe there's a 25% probability that it can be there in the society in some form. But don't get panicked by what I'm saying because it will be a controllable form, you know, of the virus. That is, it will be there in society. But I think that economically, we can allow people to go back to work with precautions so that economy doesn't get affected. So we not have as bad an effect as the March stock market effect that you saw. So I hope that uh, a long-winded explanation was... Uh, Satisfying to you. Thank you. Uh, the next question, sir. Is India ready for index funds? Are you planning to launch index funds soon? Uh, can you hold on? Uh, I will answer this next week uh, in terms of the market and the funds related question. Right? Definitely, I'll answer your question. And the two weeks later, if I don't address it in my issue, but I don't want to, I want to stick to the economy today. Pardon me for that. Definitely, I will uh, try and address it. Thank you, sir. The next question is, uh, will the supply side crisis eventually lead to a demand side crisis in the medium term? Uh, yes, if the supply side crisis is not addressed, the clearly the laborers who are working in the supply side of the economy will not have their incomes and so their demand will get affected, right, automatically. Uh, so I think that the India, there is a little bit that I think we have about 25% of our economy depend on agriculture. So demand from that will continue. So the supply side impact will not be so much on the rural economy. Second aspect of the supply side affecting the demand side uh, thing is that I think the supply side is easily addressable. So I think that the chances of it being a full-blown demand crisis are very less because I think sooner or later the supply can be fixed through uh, job guarantees, corporate loans, and all of those steps that the governments are taking. So if unattended to the supply crisis can definitely lead to a demand crisis, but I don't think that that's going to be the case. Uh, the next question, sir. Uh, why do you feel developed markets will recover after emerging markets? Shouldn't it be the other way around? Okay, uh, the, the reason for that expectation is because one, of course, China is considered a developing economy and uh, China is one big component of the developing market scenario. So uh, China got the crisis first, addressed it quickly because they're an authoritarian government, quickly locked down everything. They started bouncing back as you saw in various lives. So China's recovery, I don't think you should question. So China is adding to the developing markets recovering faster. So take away China. 
the rest of the developing countries vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the uh, developed countries. Again, a lot of the developing countries uh, supply to China. So China itself sources from Vietnam, Thailand, the East Asian countries a lot. So any Chinese recovery means that they will also recover ahead of time. That's another reason for emerging countries which are China oriented to recover. The third aspect here in terms of developing economies here is that I think India is another big component of this crisis. And by and large, India has handled this crisis medically better without too much impact on fiscal deficit. And because of the shift in business from China to India, a capex cycle and everything will get quicker started in India. So I think, and the good monsoon has helped India to uh, like agrarian and rural economy to recover faster. So India again will probably recover faster than the uh, developed markets. In the developed markets, the recovery will get delayed compared to the uh, emerging markets because uh, what happens is there is that ultimately a lot of their production is dependent on a lot of emerging markets, right? Because they uh, historically have been buying. So while the emerging market may supply, that supply will go first to satisfying their local demand, and then it will come to the export demand. So the developed economies, right, they will take a little bit of time to come back and recover. But fourth and final point, right, the reason these numbers look so disparate, right, is because the basic average growth rate of the developed world is one to two percent, or maybe three max, whereas of the developing world, like China, India, Vietnam, we are at the five, six, seven percent normal growth. Forget about what happened to close. So that growth itself, the fact that for many years the developing economies have been growing at double the rate of the advanced economies, means that their recovery will happen from minus two percent to minus three percent to plus two three. But we will be going, even though we may go minus four, we can go to plus five, plus six, plus seven very easily. So the core growth rate of the developing countries are at a double the rate of the developed countries. Hence, the bounce back will also be faster. So the next question is, what is your view on the service sector? So I think the service sector is going to be the real definition of the V-shaped recovery because the downtrend of the V in services is, is very bad and will be very bad for some time because services, banks are part of services sector, right? You have malls, you have uh, retail, you have all of these, which got severely impacted in the lockdown. So the impact on the lockdown of the crisis on the services sector is very sharp, very services may have dropped to record low levels of low double digits, right? Recovery will take time, right? Because lockdown has to open up and only those sectors can services uh, uh, hiring and utilization take place, right? And clearly there are parts of the services sector like hotels, like airlines, which will take a long time to recover because the basic method of dealing with the world, right? Work from home, consume from home, your entertainment, uh, order from home, your food, fundamentally will change to some extent behavior. So naturally internet-based service companies will recover faster, but your old traditional model, brick and mortar model will take time to recover. So, but once this crisis is behind us, the services sector, the pent up demand will show a very sharp. So I expect the services sector to roughly show a W-shaped recovery because like I said, immediate bounce back in certain sectors will be there. Then as the lockdown opens up, unlock opens up, there will be some comment of correction and then a sharp rise. So I would say that uh, in a slightly longer term time frame, services sector will actually outperform because of the sheer bounce back. But in the short run, it is definitely more affected as you said, manufacturing PMI has bounced back faster than the services PMI. Our next question, next question. sir. What is the optimum exposure one should have in foreign securities? How long do you think the Fed can continue to provide liquidity in the global market? So see, foreign securities, uh, uh, I would say that uh, the Fed uh, has an unlimited supply of money. So until they see the green shoots of US economy properly and get a conviction there, they can continue printing money. The current year's US fiscal deficit is going to be 19% of GDP. That's not worrying them. So I don't think there's any limit to what the Fed can spend, okay, They're technically. Definitely Mr. Trump would influence them to keep doing that till the end of the year because of the election. 
So I see that next year, post-election, depending on how they recover from COVID, whether Mr. Trump or Mr. Biden comes to power, and, and this will decide the future course of action. So from a foreign security's perspective, right, bear in mind that if you have a three to five year perspective, the rupee depreciation would come to your help because rupee over a long term has a 5% depreciation. That's straight away something that you will get a benefit over the longer run. In fact, last one year, it's actually depreciated 9%. So depreciation works to your advantage when you invest in abroad. Second aspect is in your asset allocation abroad, right? you got to look at it that developing countries are going to recover faster than developed countries. So hence your allocation in foreign should be to developing countries. How do you play developing countries? Uh, whether you want to directly invest in developing countries' stock markets, gain high risk, uh, high reward, do you have enough information about a Vietnamese market or a Korean market or a this market? So using mutual funds which have exposure to diverse geographies in international so that you get the benefit of the dollar, uh, the rupee depreciation there, plus the growth of the emerging countries apart from India. Indian growth, you're going to participate through your Indian investments in any way, right? So non-India growth, whichever companies are positioned to capture that, whether they are listed in the developed markets or developing market doesn't matter. But the economic growth should be captured. So I would say, yes, good time to invest uh, in uh, foreign securities as a diversification to your portfolio, but pay special attention to, is that portfolio truly diversified? Our next question, sir. Do you expect interest rates to remain low for an extended period of time? Well, uh, I think that uh, the extended period of time is the clue here. Definitely in the short run, we are not going to see GDP growth recover. RBI, food supply is going to be strong. So we don't expect food inflation to rise very fast. Uh, oil prices are going to be soft. So we don't expect that imported inflation to come up. So given a soft inflation outlook, uh, we do expect interest rates to remain soft. The only uh, question here is the borrowing of the government. Uh, which is going to be quite high uh, in terms of meeting all the expenditure that they have promised on the uh, Atmanirbhar program and the regular stuff. So the government's borrowing means that GSEC rates will not come down as much. They've already come down significantly, but they will probably remain or go slightly higher. So interest rates as defined by government borrowing rates, I don't see a sharp drop. In the rest of the economy, uh, clearly banks are flush with money. That's why they've been cutting their savings bank rates and FD rates. So they are sitting flush with money and unless demand for money sharply jumps up, right? It's not going to be a case, right? So because of that factor, you're going to see that lending rates will remain soft in order to boost demand. So I do expect uh, that for the next year, year and a half, two years at least, uh, rates in the marketplace will be fairly soft. In fact, the commercial paper and other debt security market are already showing that and top corporates are able to borrow 90-day paper at 3% and 4% easily. So I think uh, uh, reasonably soft market economy rates are uh, uh, in the anvil for at least a quarter, year, two, two years. I don't see a problem. Uh, after that, you have to see whether next year's monsoon is going to be great and whether Indian GDP grows, in which case the growth inflation trade-off might lead to RBI wanting to uh, hike the rates. But for the next year or two, I do see a softer interest rate regime. Our next question, sir, is from Abhijit Parikh. Regarding fund performance, a small cap fund lags performance by a heavy margin. I, I, I think we can avoid the questions on the market and the fund performance. Um, and, sure, uh, sir. I'll... This thing. Right? I think if you see any such questions, you keep them parked. We can handle it in the next uh, Absolutely. Uh, question hour on the next market. So you can straight away okay. at your end. Look at it. Let's speak to the economy. Sure. Okay. Um, the next question then, uh, why do you feel lower corporate tax rates will attract more FDIs? What's the connection? Well, it's a straightforward, right? Uh, of FDI is foreign direct investment, right? It's that money which comes in to set up a factory or a shop or uh, anything here. Now, how does that money, that money comes in dollars or in euros or whatever, how will he take back his money from the profits that this company makes? How will he take it back? By either he will list it in the stock market here and so he will uh, offload his shares and take the money back or he will take the dividends from the annual earnings of that company. Right now, if the tax rates are low, so he sits down and does a ten-year projection. Right, anybody putting in thousand crores into India will say over ten years, hundred crores a year. If I take out, I'll get my money back. Correct. So if you're going to tax it, 
that's going to limit the amount that he can take back end of the day it's a net present value of his investments whether he does it in vietnam does it in china does it in india the relative tax rate means that that's the money that he can earn back from the capital because he will be borrowing that money from a banker overseas and he has to repay that so the tax clearly is a very very important factor because the npv that is the payback period of his project will come down because of the lower tax rate so i think it's probably one of the most critical factors that a foreigner looks at and in fact just cutting the tax rate did not serve the purpose feedback came from the potential fdi people to the government that you are given a lower tax rate but you are taxing my dividends because that's the only route through which i can take my money back so the government in fact in the budget which followed the tax cut they immediately waived the dividend distribution tax so clearly in all of the things right everybody whether it's a foreigner or an indian looks at tax as an unnecessary expenditure and he feels why should i give it away to the government so any easing there is definitely a huge and big positive boost for a foreign investor and i would do not underestimate the power of that and i'll tell you one of the reasons india's manufacturing cycle did not take off from a, a make in india and export out of india perspective is because since 1997 we are the only country of all the emerging countries which kept its tax rate at 35 to 40% all our competitors had brought it down substantially to the 20% levels that's why we took the step of making it 17% so believe me this is probably the single most important step in attracting long term money into our economy the next question sir covid 19 appears to have pushed more companies into making relocating decisions from china how do you think india will benefit from these and how soon do you expect we'll see these benefits india will definitely benefit but i must tell you that we are not fully ready to take that money i mentioned corporate tax cuts the very positive is not doing business improvement very big positive a lot of reforms the government has done very big positive but we are still not there fully as somebody who can take it because labor reforms uh, land reforms and infrastructure are still lagging behind some of the other competitors so a recent study said that roughly about 450 billion dollars of exports has a potential to move to china and india is slated to get about 15% of it at about 69 70 billion dollars vietnam is expected to get 15% of that so clearly uh, while india has a chance to get it uh, i would say other countries like vietnam are today in a better position so over the next year year and a half vietnam will continue to be getting more of it than india in the next year year and a half india has to do more reforms has to get the labor land reforms all in order and get it properly done so that we can then benefit so i would say give it 12 to 18 months for us to really see a revolution in terms of a big shift into india from china that's number 1 number two is that where will it happen earlier later i think electronics is where it will happen first because there you don't need too much land most electronic components need air conditioned multi story buildings and you have good technically skilled engineers in india so electronics is one space where i would say that we would probably be number you know already you are seen apple and uh, samsung have shifted key facilities out there and recently you saw foxconn which is a key supplier to apple is going to invest a billion dollars in capacity in india so electronics i would say india would be the number one to grab it uh, uh, along with taiwan because taiwan is also a leader in electronics but the rest of the businesses hardcore heavy industries and all of that i would say give it 18 months time for the government to get its act in order right oh uh, the next question so is what instruments fiscal or monetary should be additionally introduced to simulate economic growth <laughs> so i think that um, one of the key things here is uh, reserve bank of india while it's announced the liquidity measures to banks and thing they are not directly buying government of india debt when the fed announces a monetary stimulus they are actually buying government of india debt so what happens is that money directly goes there to do but in india the rbi has still not as hesitated to directly buy government bonds right i think that's an instrument which i would expect or would be used in the coming days because that's the best way to manage the fiscal and and, and that's one instrument 
The other instrument to which uh, uh, we have desisted from doing is uh, uh, for the automobile sector, something that the US did in the previous cycle, which is called cash for clunkers. That is older vehicles. The best way to boost it is, is to kill older vehicles and say the government will actually buy older vehicles or they'll give you a cash in hand if you trade your old vehicle for a new vehicle. So that's again another uh, fiscal uh, decision which can give a boost to automobile manufacturing and all of the related industries. The US did that very well previously and that's good. The third, again, not an instrument, but I think that the government has to allocate money to bank recapitalization because while you're given moratorium of three months and another three months and maybe you know another three months, you're basically, you're kicked that NPA bucket down the road. You've postponed the day of crisis and day of reckoning. Ultimately, the banks have to recognize the NPAs from certain companies which go bust. At that stage, the recapitalization of the banks. So the bank government needs the money to recapitalize the public sector banks uh, in a big way. So that's another uh, measure. I would not call it an instrument, but another measure, another next budget, I would say an allocation to bank recapitalization is a key, key need. Uh, the fourth thing is that uh, if the lockdown unlock is leading to more crisis and then more problems, the government has stayed away from direct revenue expenditure like Narega. They did 40,000 crores, I know, but uh, the cry and the demand was for more. They have announced food grain supply for till November, right? But I think if the crisis lasts for longer, the government may not have a choice but to put more cash in the hands of the people. So direct cash transfers, much as it uh, rating agencies may not like it, maybe there may be no choice to the government but to announce a fresh set of uh, uh, cash-based transfers to help the poor uh, segment of the economy. But instrument-wise, I think uh, there is nothing much more. I think more or less the corporate, the guarantees was a view good instrument that they used, and that that's they can enhance the usage of guarantees by announcing guarantees for loans to a much wider set of sectors. Final point here is sector-specific announcements have not been made by the government in terms of relief packages. So the airline industry, the hotel industry, the malls, the entertainment industry, all are crying out for some kind of a waiver, a loan waiver, something like that. So instruments like those, which are targeting specific sectors, again, the government has not yet entered that arena. I would say that in the next six months, the government might want to do that to help them out because they are critical. Ultimately, you don't want a monopoly situation in an airline or a monopoly situation in any uh, industry the government might step in on a sector-specific uh, aid or uh, uh, help. All right. Um, we've received many questions from viewers on the markets and funds, which we'll address in our next question, our session. In the yeah. interest of time, we'll take one final question on the economy. Yeah. For the other economy-related yeah, questions, we will leave responses in our comment section and take a few in the next question, our session. So sure. the last question, sir. Can you explain what you meant by W-shaped recovery you mentioned earlier? What does it mean for the economy? So when I said W-shaped recovery, what I meant is that we are already seeing a V happen. That is, the fall has happened. And lots of sectors, including economy, have seen the bounce back. And though the V is forming. Now, the initial bounce back was sharp and swift because the pent-up demand was getting expressed. People who didn't buy a car for two months went and bought cars. People who didn't go anywhere, open up, they went and saw movies. So the immediate bounce back was there. Now, when a V-shaped recovery means that bounce is sustainable, means it's a V. Means the rest of the arm of the V continues to grow. But as we are seeing now, that the wherever unlock has been announced, we are finding that the coronavirus has again reared its head. Again, fresh lockdowns are being formed. So naturally, there will be a slowdown. So it'll be stable and it'll go down. So when the half V has been formed, second half, and then again, due to the fact that unlock has led to the coronavirus reappearing, means there'll be a further slowdown in those sectors, especially in those cities, you'll we'll see a drop again. But then they, when they do a fresh lockdown, now they would have learned from the experience and the future unlock will happen when they have a clarity that everything is normal. So then the true arm of the V, which didn't get completed, will get completed. So you'll end up with a W-shaped recovery. Implications for the economy are nothing but a delay. So if this year we are expecting a 
4.5% uh, negative GDP growth as per the IMF World Bank, right, as of now. So if you take this into account, that minus 4.5 could go to 5.5 negative, right? That's the impact on the economy. But I still believe that the following year, whatever happens, I believe that by April, May, June of 2021, uh, we should be beyond this VW, whatever, and be firmly on a recovery path. So I don't think the following year's GDP growth is going to get affected by whether it's this year, is it a V or a W that is going to be seen. So short-term GDP growth will go even more negative if it's a W, but longer-term GDP growth, I don't think will get significantly affected in the following year. FY21-22, you should see a good healthy return, whether this year is a V or a W. I hope that uh, answers your question. Thank you. And uh, that is the final question we could take due to paucity of time. Thank you once again for the overwhelming response. And uh, I'm very glad that this questionnaire format has been received so well by the viewers. We'll keep going. So you can look forward to uh, Sundaram coming back to you every month with an update on the economy and an update on the markets sandwiched by two questionnaire sessions so that in that process, in the process of a month, you will get a good perspective on the economy and the markets and your questions. And I think the real benefit of these questions, first I'd like to thank those who asked the questions. They took the trouble to actually go through the presentation, understand it and come back. Thank you for that. But more importantly, the people who have dialed in and the people who will be seeing this YouTube link over the next few days as will be made available, you will learn from the fact of how others have asked these questions. It may have occurred to you and you didn't ask or it may not have occurred to you, but because somebody else asked, your knowledge would have improved. So I think this questionnaire session has been a big, strong step in making our investor community a wiser investment community, which is the original purpose behind this wise card series of webinars. Thank you for your overwhelming support and look forward to being continuously in touch with you all over the coming weeks and months. Stay safe during this period of the crisis and all the very best to you. Thank you.